Hello, and welcome to part one of my video series on how to use the Blender game engine. In this video, I'm going to be giving you a basic introduction to how to get started with the game engine, and by the end of this video, we're going to have created a character that we can control as the player using the arrow keys on our keyboard. Let's go ahead and dive in. The first thing I'll do, of course, is click on my splash screen to get rid of it. The very next thing I have to do is change my render engine from the Cycles render engine, or the Blender render engine, to the Blender game engine. Now what that means is that up here in the information bar in our Blender user interface, right now I have my render engine set to the Cycles render engine. We have a couple more options here. We have the old Blender render engine, but what we're going to be using in this video series is the Blender game engine. So at the beginning of every video, hopefully I'll remember to remind you to do that, but we need this Blender game engine uh, selected in order to continue. As soon as I change that, you'll notice that over here in the properties window, a lot of the options changed. What we have here, instead of being able to render out a scene, like, like we were making an animation, I can instead start simulating my game or start playing my game. The quick way to start playing your game is by having your mouse in the 3D viewport, and if you press P on your keyboard, that means play, and as soon as you press P, the lighting or the default graphics will change, you'll see what your game actually looks like, and you can start playing your game. Of course, we don't have anything in our game yet. Uh, to get out of this, you press escape on your keyboard. If you use Blender for a long time, you probably know that if you press P, and you don't know what that means, it gets you into a weird mode, that is the playable game. Let's go ahead and start talking about physics, because when you're making a 3D game, physics are a natural part of the mechanics of the game. With my cube selected, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select it and drag it straight up on the z-axis, and I'm going to add a ground. So I'll press shift A on my keyboard, and I'm going to add a mesh plane, and with that mesh plane selected, I'll press S on my keyboard and drag out to make it a lot bigger, and click. I now have a ground, and for all uh, intents and purposes in this video, I have a character, which is our cube. To get started with physics, we have to go over here into our properties window and to the bouncing ball tab. That's the tab in the properties window for physics. And of course, these options are different if you have the Blender Cycles render engine or the old render engine set up. But with the game engine, it's much simpler. We have physics type static, and that's the way that all uh, meshes at least are, they are static objects. It means that when we press play or P on our keyboard, they don't move, they don't do anything, but they are actually part of a physics world. How can I tell that? Well, I'm going to go ahead and press escape and change the physics type of this cube, our character, from static to, and we have lots of options here, to rigid body. Now what rigid body means, if you're familiar with physics simulation inside of just Blender animation, you'll know that rigid body means that objects will react to gravity and they will collide with other objects. So that's what I'll select, rigid body, and now if I press P, we should expect that cube to interact with gravity, and because the ground is a static, it's still a physics object, it's a static object, it'll interact with the other objects, but it will not fall with gravity. So I'll press P on my keyboard, and the cube falls. I'll go ahead and press escape because it's over, and I'll select my cube and I'll press R to rotate it. Let's go ahead and see what happens if I now press P to play with this cube um, rotated so it has a corner pointing down. P. Nothing happens here, and that's my next point. When we're making a game, the meshes in our scene aren't necessarily the collision bounds for interacting with other objects in the scene. So what I'll do here is I'll press escape on my keyboard. What I have to do here is check collision bounds and set it to be a certain shape. So with the uh, character or my cube selected, I'm going to scroll down under the physics tab and you'll see an area called collision bounds. Right now it's grayed out, which means that I think it means that there is a default uh, bound. I think it's actually a sphere, but that obviously does not work for this shape. So I'm going to check collision bounds, and there are different shapes that we can use. It does not use the mesh as the collision boundaries by default. Um, it uses a uh, box once we enable this. So box sounds like it might work. Let's go ahead and press P on the keyboard. And as you can see, it acts more like a cube naturally would. It kind of tumbles and falls over and finally lands on one of its six sides. Great. Let's go ahead and talk about how to control this character using the arrow keys on our keyboard. So I'll press escape on my keyboard. In fact, what I might do is press X on my keyboard to delete that cube, and I'll press shift A and add a new cube, and maybe I'll put it above the ground. Just like before, I'm going to change the physics type of this new object from static 
to I'm gonna mention here that there is one more kind of physics type here it's dynamic and dynamic is like rigid body but if I select dynamic dynamic will not tumble it will just fall and land on the ground when we use rigid body it actually acts like a shape naturally would interacting with other objects in other words when I had the cube pointed with a corner down it tumbled and it landed um, in a natural way but with dynamic if I put this, the cube at the same rotation and move it straight up and I press P on my keyboard it doesn't land even if I change or enable collision bounce box and I press P it doesn't tumble so that's the difference between rigid body and dynamic dynamic if you do not want your character to do any tumbling um, let's say you have a character that you're moving around and he's walking and you have an animation built in you would probably use dynamic and not rigid body so that's the little difference there I'll press uh, control Z a few times what we're gonna do here is we're gonna open up a new window that you've probably never seen before if all you've ever used Blender for is animation so what I'll do here is I'll grab this little top cross hatched area and drag it down and I'm gonna change this bottom window into the logic editor and that is with a little icon of a joystick that's very appropriate because this is where we actually program our game now in this video series I'm not going to get into any actual programming we're not going to use uh, blenders language or the language that blender uses which is Python we're not going to get into that at all if you were hoping for that I'm sorry um, but we're just going to be using these logic bricks to program the logic of our game and we can do a lot with these logic bricks right now this is actually quite uh, or everything in here is quite large so what I'll do is I'll press N on my keyboard to hide that side um, properties panel and if I scroll up or scroll down it'll zoom out I can make these things really small but I'll keep them as big as I can uh, for you and for the purpose of this video this is the area where we're gonna be adding what are called logic bricks which are in place of actually typing code out to be able to control the logic and controls of our game now when you have different objects selected you get access to different whole blocks or different sets of code so it's very important that you select the object that you want to add the code to in this video we're going to be adding logic to be able to control um, the movement of this character with the arrow keys on our keyboard so what we have to do here is we have to add groups of three for the most part this is being very simple I have to add a sensor I have to add a controller and I have to add an actuator for everything that I want to do well what do I want to do well I want to make the cube move forward when I press the up arrow on my keyboard when I'm playing the game so the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna add a new sensor and there are lots of kinds of we're gonna get through a lot of these in this video series but I'm gonna add a keyboard sensor that lets me see or lets the cube know if I'm pressing a key down on the keyboard so I'll add that and when I add that sensor it adds a new brick or block here and I can collapse it or I can hide it but in here I have to specify what key I'm actually listening for so what I do is next to this keyword I click on this button and then I press a key on my keyboard that I want it to check for so I'll click on that little button and it says press a key that's very appropriate I'm gonna press the up arrow on my keyboard and so it knows that's the up arrow that I'm looking for if I click on that button again I can specify a different key on my keyboard s but no I want the up arrow of course you can use W A S D if you want to if that's what you prefer but I'm gonna use the arrow keys the next thing I have to do is add a controller but we're actually gonna get back to that in a second because that's sort of just the middle step and we'll get into what this actually means um, in future videos so when we press a key on our keyboard we want something to happen we have a sensor it's a keyboard sensor so the cube can now detect if we're pressing a key on the keyboard what's gonna happen if we press that key well we want the cube to move the result in your sensor is gonna be done or performed or the action is gonna be performed by an actuator it's the action that is performed by the actuator so I'm gonna add a new actuator and again there's lots of things and we're gonna be going over many of them in this video series but I'm gonna be adding a motion actuator I want the uh, character to move so I'll click on motion and when we do that of course we get a new logic brick so here's the thing we have a keyboard sensor which is always listening to check to see if we're doing something um, that it can sense for in this case a keyboard press and we have a motion actuator which will do the thing that we want to do but we have to connect them so what I'll do here is these little dots or circles actually have to be connected so what I'll do here is I'm gonna start over here at the sensor and click with my mouse cursor right on that little hole and click and drag and it's gonna make a noodle 
that I'm going to connect over to this socket. You can basically think of this as an out socket and an in socket. So I'm going to click and drag and that goes with my mouse cursor right over that socket and I'll let go, click. And as you can see, it added a controller in between. We're not going to really get why that happens in this video, but it's always going to be, uh, for the most part, an AND controller. You can just believe me there and you don't have to touch anything uh, in this video. So I've got a keyboard sensor. I've got an AND controller, which we're always going to be using, and an actuator, which is making the cube move. But we have lots of options here. We have to tell it which direction to move. Well, we have our cube selected, and right now we can see our gizmo following the main axes of the world. We have the red X and uh, green Y and blue Z axis, but these are the global axes. I want to switch over to see the local axes. How I do that is down here on the header of my 3D viewport, I'm going to change global to local. Now, that doesn't really change anything because our cube hasn't been rotated at all. But when we have this set to local, we can see our gizmo has the local axes or where the cube knows that it's itself pointing. If I press R on my keyboard and then Z and rotate the cube with local gizmo uh, mode checked, my gizmo now points in the direction of the cube, so the cube actually knows its own direction. If I flip back over into global mode, you'll see that the axes still follow the main world axes. Well, if we're controlling a character's movement, we want to know where the character is pointing, or we want to know that the character know, knows where it's pointing. So I'm going to control Z that, and I want to be in local gizmo display. And you can switch it back at any point. The reason I say that is because we want to apply a linear velocity to this object as soon as we press the up arrow on our keyboard. We're going to be going on the Y axis and we're going to be moving in the positive direction, which means in the direction that this arrow is pointing. So down here in the motion logic brick, I'm going to change the linear velocity um, of the Y axis and I'm going to change it to 3. You can play around with these numbers, but I commonly use 3 to get started off. And I want to check this little, or press this little L button to make it dark. What that L stands for is local. If you don't check that and you use the up arrow key, you won't be able to steer your character in the direction that they, uh, or you want it to move. So I've got local checked. I've got three on the Y axis. It's connected up. It knows to use the up arrow. So let's go ahead and try this out. I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to press uh, P on my keyboard to play. And if I tap the up arrow on my keyboard, it's actually controlling the movement of the cube in the Y axis. Now you'll notice that if I tap the up arrow, it actually drifts. And that's because we are applying a linear velocity. I'll press escape on my keyboard so you can see my mouse again. We're applying a linear velocity and this allows um, the cube to actually move with a force as if you pushed it and it doesn't stop automatically. If you want your character to stop automatically as soon as you let go of that arrow key, instead of using linear velocity, I'll turn that back down to zero, I'm gonna use simple motion, just location. So I'm gonna change that to three and press enter, and then I'll press P with my mouse in the 3D viewport. And if I press the up arrow on my keyboard, well, it moves really fast. So I have to adjust my numbers. I'm not going to use that though. I would probably use something like 0.1. Let's try that again. Yeah, that works a little better. So I could play around with it, but you'll notice that now when I let go, it doesn't keep on sliding. Let's press escape. I'll get rid of that value. Zero, turn my linear velocity up to three again for the Y axis. And let's go ahead and add some more controls. Now, there are a few different ways that you can make a character move. I could just make um, a few more keyboard sensors and a few more actuators to make the character move in the exact same way on the positive x-axis and the minus x-axis, and that would be okay, but I want this character to be controlled more like a car. In other words, when you press the left and right arrow keys, it steers like a car. It rotates on the z-axis as if a pole was running through the middle or going through up and down following that blue arrow and you were twisting that pole to make it face in one direction or the other. To do that, I have to add more logic bricks, but we're going to be using rotation instead of linear velocity. What I'll do first though is I'm going to change the name of these bricks because when you're programming, you're going to have a lot of bricks and it's better to collapse them, and once they're collapsed, you want to know what they actually do. So I'm going to change the name of this brick from just keyboard. I'll click in that little box, and I'm going to press or type up arrow. Okay, so I can collapse that logic brick, and I'll pan over. By the way, if you want to pan around in this window, you have to orbit with your middle mouse um, wheel like a button. So it's just like orbiting in this window. 
you can pan or you can just use the uh, sliders of course I'm gonna name this brick I'm gonna say move forward now why am I naming it that because that's what it actually does it moves the cube forward I can collapse that now let's go ahead and add a few more bricks I'm gonna add a new sensor it's gonna be a keyboard sensor and the key we want to use is the left arrow key so I'll click in that little area press left I'm gonna add an actuator now so I'll click on add actuator and it's going to be a motion as well. So I'll click on motion. I've got to connect them. And again, automatically it adds that AND controller, which we're not going to get into why that is uh, in this video. So I'll click that little circle, drag it into this one over here. By the way, if it doesn't quite work, that's because you didn't actually aim it properly on the input. So I'll click and let go of the mouse right over that input. We want it to rotate on the Z axis. And I want it to rotate um, left. So what I'll do is I'll select rotation z-axis and I believe left is positive. It seems a little bit backwards to me um, but I'm gonna say 5 degrees and I'll press enter on its local axis again because that's uh, dark. Let's go ahead and try that out. I'll press P on my keyboard and press the left arrow and as you can see it's moving left. Let's go ahead and name those bricks and program right. So I'm gonna name this right. If I can spell right, right arrow there we go I'll collapse that one this one's gonna be turn right okay let's go ahead and add a new sensor for the keyboard so add sensor keyboard and we're gonna add an actuator it's gonna be a motion actuator of course let's connect um, these ports click let go and I'm gonna use rotation this time we're gonna use I believe the last one I used five so for this one, I'm going to use negative 5. I forgot one critical step, though. I didn't specify what key we're actually sensing for. That's an easy mistake to make when you're first getting used to this Blender game engine. So I'll click on the key button, and I'll press right arrow. And let's go ahead and name this right away. Right arrow. Ah, I see what I did. I named the other one right arrow. You probably caught me. It's the left arrow. So I'll rename that one left arrow. And let's go ahead and name this one right arrow. There we go. We want this to rotate. It's all set up. I want to name it turn right, although I made this one the wrong name as well. So turn left, and this one's going to be turn right. Let's go ahead and try that out. So I'll press P on my keyboard. I should be able to turn in both directions. That's great. And because I have, and I'll press escape, when I have the linear velocity set, with this L button press, that means it's moving linear on its local Y axis. That means that if I press the forward arrow key, it knows that it's moving in that direction, but if I spin the character a little bit and press forward, it's not gonna move in that same direction in terms of the global axes, it's gonna move with its front always facing forward, which means I can, of course, steer around. So I've added just a few logic bricks here, and I have a simple character movement, by the way, if you don't have this L button checked, let's see what happens. I'll press P on my keyboard. I can move forward. I can spin, but it's still going to move in that global Y axis. I don't want that to happen, so I need that L button pressed. What I'll do here to finish off this video is I'm going to make this window full screen by putting my mouse in this window and pressing Control up arrow on my keyboard, and I will expand all of these out so you can see what these all are in full screen. That'll be it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.